speaker tonight is Lindsay Huddleston. Um, Lindsay has spent time and continues to spend time as a psychology, sports psychology consultant with uh, USA Basketball. You'll see his backpack over there. Uh, NBA general managers and players, Division I athletes and coaches. Um, Lindsay focuses on motivational speaking. Uh, Lindsay's also, uh, he's got some press credentials with Michigan State University. He covers the football team and the basketball team. And Lindsay has also spent time, uh, like Chelsea was just touching on, um, in high school athletics, and he's, he's been a uh, varsity basketball coach. So without further ado, our first guest speaker, Lindsay Huddleston. Thank you, guys. Uh, one other thing, how do I unblock uh, this? <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. more technical difficulties. First thing you guys know about whether it's sports or politics, and I'll touch on that, is that you got to be prepared for anything to happen and be able to go with it. Because whatever you start out playing with, it just may go to the sky. And I think success comes from people who can just adapt. Uh, I'll talk about this in my intro. Uh, one of my jobs was the advanced person for Governor Granholm. And you, that's when they talk about you're better off asking for forgiveness than asking for permission sometimes. Now, I'm not telling you guys to run out there and live by that creek and get locked up or something like that. <laughs> well, Lindsay told me that that's the way to do it. Okay. Uh, I'll be toggling back and forth. I want to thank you, Max, uh, for reaching out. Max reached out to me on social media a while ago. Uh, very impressive. Uh, I don't know what you guys think about him, but he's really acting in a way that you need to be successful in the world. Because the great thing about social media is that you can connect with someone, meet them, and build a relationship. And that's how you all need to be thinking, especially if you want to go into a career like sports, where all the experience, excuse me, all the resources go to the athletes. And I'll talk about that in a second. So uh, with that, let me go through here. Uh, my background, over 25 years experience as a teacher, I returned to my old high school to teach. So everyone think back in their mind, go back and imagine it, teaching in your old high school. So I did that and it was crazy. And the first thing I had to do when I went back was apologize to all my teachers for all the ruckus that I called. They were like, karma is serious, isn't it, right? So that was that I taught and I coached basketball there. I was a junior varsity head coach, which is something. Uh, Really was great. My guys end up going on to become coaches. So think about how I feel when my guys have graduated, become coaches, look back on what I taught them and helped them. Traveled the country and Canada as a motivational speaker with a company called Student Success Incorporated, uh, making college count. I would talk to high school seniors about what to do to prepare to go to college, and it was a great experience, and that kind of molded me for my own work. I uh, worked as a lobbyist, corporate lobbyist, big money job. I should just put dollar signs right here. And that's something I'm going to talk about. I don't know you guys' financial background. I got a chance to talk to about a third of you. I'm sorry for not being able to be able to ask everyone things about your background. But um, that was really important. I mean, it was a great job. At the time, I was leaving Governor Granholm's office, and it was like being drafted, literally. Like what you wanted to do when you were finishing up in a political role like that is you wanted to get that call up. And the biggest call you can get was becoming a lobbyist. And I got a call from the biggest corporation in the world, which was Walmart. I ended up lobbying for them. Now, growing up in Detroit, you know, strong democratic stronghold, that, those were my principles. So going to Walmart was a change, but I was able to provide them a great resource because I was able to work both sides of the aisle, literally, based on the relationships that I had. And it was an interesting experience. And one thing I do want to say, I know they always say, hey, save your comments to after, but if you got a question, bring it up now. I mean, I, I'm giving you that license. You know, I talked to Max about that earlier. I want to be very informal. Uh, I don't want to miss an opportunity. Because the fact that I went to this school and was on this campus, and I think I, only, I didn't even come to this building while I was on campus. So to be back here speaking right now, there's a lot of stuff I can talk about, right? And don't let me go off. And Chelsea, if I start going off a little bit, you, yeah, just give me the nod and we can bring me back. But I, I want you to better get as much as possible. And my goal is when we're done, to still hang out for a little while. I'm not going to burn up the highway to head back that quick. Uh, author, uh, finishing up my second book now. The first one was on athletes and charity. I'll show you a little brief about that, called Unlikely Saviors, Realizing the Positive Impact Athletes Can Have on Society Through Philanthropy. Interview members of the Fab Five, Jalen Rose, Jimmy King, uh, Greg Kelsch, who played with Magic Johnson. They won the national championship at Michigan State the first time. Also uh, had some football players who were Michigan football players at the time who have since gone to the NFL. Now they're retired. So it was just – it was a great experience. But also I created a nonprofit from that. That's something Max and I talked about. Uh, my second one, and I used it to be able to go into high schools in the inner city in Detroit to uh, let middle school athletes promote health and wellness. Because I always believe that athletes, and you guys know this, who I'm talking to, 
know, athletes, you know, they're going to pull people in. People want to listen to what the athlete says. Quickly, if you had the, uh, you know, somebody who was a well-known CEO and a punter off the of Alabama championship team, and they said one guy is in this room talking and the other is in this room, it's going to be a hard choice for some people. Even though he's a punter, you may not know who he is walking down the street, but sports does that, and that's one thing I love. But anyway, the second book, uh, which was on the – that was a great promo you guys sent out too. Who did the social media for that? Good, good, hey, good job. Good job. It was, it, was, it was great, and my social media responded really well. But second book is the SPS Edge, uh, a guide to mental toughness in sports and life. And what I do is use my – I'm sorry. That's the people about my book right now. Carl, I can't talk to you right now. Um, guide to mental toughness in sports and life. Because what I do is take my corporate experience as well as my sports experience because you guys are all locked in on sports, but there's other aspects that come, and we'll talk about that in the presentation. And also, doing work as a sports psychology consultant, but I had to add another line, sports media broadcasting. Don't ask how to happen. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, how things happen, right, Chelsea? Things just happen, and you get on the track somewhere, and it happens. So now I'm uh, full of press, uh, I have press credentials to cover Michigan State football and basketball, which is awesome. So I'm in the press box, but I haven't. Uh, giving up on who I am. I'm a sports psychology consultant. So all my questions are based on mental toughness, and it's about creating a niche, Nick, and being able to get in a certain lane, and I'll talk about that some more. And it's gotten to the point that my last interview with Coach Izzo was uh, on media day, and to get to a point that I developed a relationship with him, and we've had our ups and downs, and I'll talk about that. But for him to say, Lindsay, with the work you do, you know what I mean. So when you hear that kind of thing right there from a Hall of Fame coach, that means you kind of made it, you know, to be there. And that's where I want you guys to be. So that's the background, uh, generally speaking. And um, going forward, this kind of blacks out a little bit. Let's see. Okay. I've always, uh, I want to make sure I don't miss something. Does it go back? Let's see. Previous. Just to make sure. Okay, I didn't miss it. All right, I've always been committed to a life of service. And what's funny about this picture? Yeah, obviously I went to the Marines, but I took that when I was here. I went to the Marines when I was at Western. I was hanging on campus with my guys. I mean, I'll, I'll give the short version of that. And I said to myself, I said, man, either this summer, I'm going to sit on campus, get drunk, run up my credit cards. I need to do something with my life. <laughs> and it, it literally was that kind of decision I had to make. But it also was based on, I'm in a fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. It's the first African-American fraternity, 1906. And I remember... I looked at my frat brothers, and if they're looking at me on social media, don't trip. I say, okay, if it had to go down, who's going to do something? And the fact that I'm from Detroit and grew up in a rough area, that, that's not it. Because when I went to the Marines, they assumed that I was like, you must be a killer. I, I failed on the rifle range. I, I, I debunked all kind of stereotypes. Brother couldn't shoot. They, just, they couldn't figure that out, right? So I looked around my peer group, and I said, if, who's going to step up? And I think that can be a way to look at life in many cases. You know, they talk about courage isn't that you're just so brave that you just move through the field. And I started that. And I think with the role you guys want to be going into, the life you want to get into, can you move through the fear? Let's not kid ourselves. People aren't just so courageous and they'll do anything. Those people are kind of crazy because they don't care. But can you push through the fear? We'll talk more about that as we go. So I've always been committed to that. And I think that's one thing you want to keep in mind. Because if you want to go into the sports business, it's sexy. And I say that being completely appropriate. Sports and fandom, uh, the word fan is related to fanatic, extreme. If you want to know extreme, look at college football on Saturday. Grown men and women painting their faces, you know, uh, following tradition. You know, I went down, I mean, people, they say people from uh, uh, Michigan, will, well, no, Ohio State will give you the people from Michigan the wrong direction. I mean, it's, it's just crazy stuff like that. But that's what you guys are looking at going into for this next generation. But you want to keep the service aspect whether it's service outside of your sport profession or whatever it may be, but what are you giving back? Richard Branson, who I consider my mentor that I haven't met yet, and I'm going to paraphrase this quote. He said, a lot of entrepreneurs think about how can I make a lot of money? Now, he's a very, very successful man. I mean, President Obama, once he was done with office, that's who we hung out with. So that's let you know how he's getting it, right? He said, a lot of entrepreneurs say, how can I make a lot of money? He said, but what you should think about, how can I help people? And if I can help people, then the money will come. And that's part of the transition I went through growing up, single-parent household in Detroit. I always say that the alumni in my sandbox was drug dealers, murders, and college graduates. Real talk. That was the life I came up in. So 
I didn't know that we weren't very wealthy. I think we were middle class, lower middle class, single parent household. So making money was important, especially when we were on campus. Another thing I want to talk about too, these ideas you have when you go back and hang out with your buddies and talk about dreams and goals, this is going to be the most important time to incubate those things right now. I'm telling you, 20 plus years ago, here's the things you say and the decrees you make and the commitments you make, the declarations you make now are going to be the most important things to go back. Because here it is all these decades later. And it was when I was on this campus and the things that I said are the things that are driving me right now. So don't downplay those. This is an opportunity to dream the biggest dreams, have the biggest thoughts, because what's going to happen is the world is going to kick you in the ass when you get out of here. Because when you get out of here, they're going to talk about, oh, you got to go to work, you got to pay these bills. People who are not here with you, struggling with you right now are going to be saying, I don't care about what school you went to. We need this, 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 and that. And it starts eating away at you. And you don't have the ability to go, I'm just going to go kick it with my buddy till 2 in the morning in this room or my girlfriend over here and just be in what I call a microcosm of the world, this bubble world. So just take hold true to these things that you're looking at right now because you're going to have to pull back on these things and be like that when you get out in the world because that's how it comes at you. So service, that's very important. And that service doesn't necessarily mean you go off and join the Marines. It could be that you're giving back. You're helping people, doing things. On my background, I've always had a skill set and passion for certain things. I was always good in politics. I always asked the young people, I said, do you guys know what that is? They're like, we know who it is. So politics with the best of them. Spent a lot of time with President Obama. Been, you know, Secret Service clearance. I mean, that's a whole other presentation I can talk about. And it was cool. And he was talking about basketball at the time, which is really cool. You know, uh, someone to get you in the court. Yeah, okay, okay. He was cool. Everyone know who this is, right? Champ is here. That's Muhammad Ali, the greatest. That was such a good time. He's the only person I let rub my hair like this. So after the presentation, <laughs> nobody can come up. So uh, that was cool. And people would talk about me like, why did you try to hit Muhammad Ali like that? Well, he took my hand. He did that. He set up the photo shoot. Of course, he was battling Parkinson's. And this was during the grand home election. And we took him back to the airport. We get ready to fly on a private plane. He took a liking to me. He really did. He pulled me to the side. And uh, when we took this picture, he took my hand and put it up there. Now, my family, ironically, comes up a uh, sporting family. My great uncle, great, great uncle, used to spar with Joe Lewis. So my mother was following sport, and my grandmother, who since passed, who I named my daughter after, yada, 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 she said, baby, you think you got him? He set you up because your whole midsection is open. So even at that time, he was still setting me up. He's like, yeah, you think you got me? Hit me if I'm going to work your body because I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> so this is what I was good at. And what's going to happen, guys, a lot of you, especially with the majors you chose, because when you chose those majors, some of you guys were sitting around the dinner table with your family, and you've been talking about it for years, whether you were at Canton, you know, wherever you may have been, and you told people things because you wanted to get that great feedback. It's like telling people, I want to be a rocket scientist. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. And they will say, that's great, Max. Good job. You do that. And you get fulfilled. You start your elevator pitch early on right then. But as you get older, you're like, no, I don't really want to do that. But I said I was going to do it. And people say, oh, you're going to make a lot of money doing that. And then you say you want to do something in sports. I go, huh? You know, and it, and it eats at your ego early on. But I was always passionate about sports. So I'll tell you a little bit more as we go about a transition I made that was really important because my real, I was good at politics, business, and public speaking. I was good at it. But my passion was education, philanthropy, and sports. I made a lot of money doing this. Six figures. And that was a lot for me. Single parent household, first generation college student. I told Max the story, I think maybe Nick earlier we were talking, that um, I was originally an education major here. And they told me, I had a year and a half left for school. I had the student teaching and some, I'm like, man, this sucks. So this is back at the Gary Center. Excuse me, that's where Chelsea works. Back at the uh, Bernhardt Center. And they probably don't even have this there. It was like a phone in the wall. You would go, you would use your, your uh, phone card. Right? He's like, he's old, right? You use your phone card and dial a little code. And I remember calling my mother back in Detroit. I said, Mom, I can either do education and be here for another year and a half, well, I can finish with political science and be done in like a semester. And at the time, I was interning in the president's office with the late president, Dr. Dieter Henneke. And she was like, well, what you want? And we were trying to figure it out together. There was that, be a teacher, and that's great. You can have no knock on teachers at all. You know, that's great, and, you know, you have money and blah, blah, blah. But I was feeling this, I had this excitement about this other opportunity. 
I can go give it a try. I don't know. I had an internship set up in Detroit with the mayor of the city. And, and me and my mother agreed, just go for it. And, and I did it and I left. And it was so funny because even my frat brothers, when we have our, you know, black and gold, you know, event, and they came. And normally when you're a graduating senior, they present you with a clock. That's just, you know, congratulations, you're graduating. So I got there. I was like, dude, where my clock at? They were like, we didn't know you were done. We just thought you left. I'm like, no, I'm done. I'm good. And people couldn't fathom that. So I'll say all that to say, you're going to have that moment. And I think that moment is what's been called, uh, 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 is a Greek term, and it'll come back to me later. But it just talks about this moment when you got to just basically just make a move. And it's hard. I mean, you really got to step out there. I had that moment with Tom Izzo. I had that moment with Tom Izzo two years ago, and it really changed the trajectory, the trajectory of our relationship. But it ended up working out because we were able to see each other eye to eye. Well, I literally went on his back porch at his office and had to knock on his door and talk about a job because I just got word that some of the consulting work I was doing wasn't going to happen. That's time, Mary daughter at home, and I said, yeah, I'm spending time with these guys. We talk shop and all this, but here's my thing. I'm not going to be scared to ask this man for an opportunity because he's who he is. I had to check myself. I got kind of pissed at myself. Like, just because he's this person, I can't go up to him as a man and say, look, I got the situation. What do you think? And I was kind of challenged, and I'm glad that I did. Let me fix that. And um, that made things tumultuous for a little while. Like I said, we just had a great interview the other day, and it worked out well. But I'll get back to this. I don't want you to think I'm just going. The thing should continue on. Now, this was the book. Unlike you said, well, it would be the book if it came up. What magic thing did we do again for that? It's gone. It's just coming. Oh, it's, oh, it's delayed. Okay, so I got to keep moving. I mean, I'm talking too long. Uh, the book, uh, the first one that I talked about, and it also led me to the next part of my life was important, raising the national standard. This is stated by former chairman, of USA Basketball, Jerry Colangelo. Love Mr. Colangelo. Uh, I was going through a very pivotal time in my life, and it's actually coming full circle now. That's another conversation. I remember being out on my birthday at my favorite restaurant, one of them in Lansing, uh, Maru Sushi. And being at the bar, somebody likes sushi. Uh, that's cool. All right, cool. Got one here now. Yeah, Maru, yeah, they're moving around. Peter told me they were going to be coming up here. And um, I remember closing my eyes and said, Lindsay, other than peace on earth, what do you want? Like, what do you really want? That's a question you guys should challenge yourself to do over time. I remember closing my eyes, and this USA basketball shield came into my mind. That was a reminder of my childhood. Because as a child, I mean, this was like the sweetest thing to see. Like, it was just crisp and clean. It meant beyond the NBA. This is like the best of the best of the best. And I was like, oh, message? I said that to myself. So thank goodness for Google. I Googled USA basketball, and it said they were having uh, a USA basketball youth development Coaches Academy in Las Vegas. I'm like, USA Basketball, Las Vegas? I got to go. So I was talking to the guys earlier, and this is really important about protecting your space or protecting your dream, I should say. Because at the time, I was doing my second six-figure job. I was doing some uh, lobbying for an education firm, uh, education reform group, and they had reached out and said, hey, we're having a meeting in Atlanta for all our national. I was the state director for Michigan. They said, hey, give us some dates when you can come to Atlanta. Now, normally what we do most cases, whatever our profession is, we defer to them all the time. Okay, whatever dates you want, and I'll take what's left. But I protected my date. I said, no, I'm going to protect this date. I'm going to say, man, I can go these days. I just can't go this day. Okay, fine. Okay. So I flew into Atlanta like on a Sunday, and Wednesday I flew to Vegas for USA Basketball. And it was the greatest thing I did. Because what I found out in Atlanta that the company was having some financial troubles. I remember getting back home and talking to my wife and said, babe, I don't know how long this is going to last. And she was like, well, maybe about three more years. I like six months. And I'll talk about that in a second. Now, moving on to this, for any of you guys, I think it's worthwhile to become familiar with this organization, especially my future general managers, people who are going to be doing some management, the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, also known as ASP. This is pretty much the umbrella organization for sports psychology. And they don't have binding laws, but they kind of, you know, how should I say, Influence. So if Western was going to hire a sports psychologist, they're going to ask that that person be ASP certified. That's just taking some courses and all these type of things. I've been fortunate to present at uh, the ASP conference on uh, some of the things I'm talking to you about. So these are the organizations that really changed me when I left corporate America. And it's also important that you make these connections. And I'll talk about these a little bit more as we go. All makes sense. Now, speaking of sports psychology, so like, what do you do? I always talk about this is what takes place in the sports psychology consulting session. 
We discuss any performance issues, assess mental strength and weaknesses, benefit from a different viewpoint. I always tell the clients I'm working with, I can't bench you. I can't impact your minutes. And that's really huge because a lot of times athletes don't want to talk to anybody on the coaching staff for fear of some type of retribution. Well, if I tell them I won't be able to play, I don't impact you like that. So that makes me be a great resource. Also, action plans. Action plans are so important. So important, I want to curse when I say action plans, but I'm not. They're very important, not just for sports, but for what you guys are going to do. We're going to talk about that in a little while, right? Set up weekly and monthly structures. you got to look at things bit by bit. What am I working on today? What am I working on by this week? And what am I getting done in a month? A lot of times, we don't like to put our goals out there for fear that if we fall short, we're just going to just crumble. I think that's something you need to look at, especially with you guys going into a career that everybody loves. Like, what are you going to do to stand out? We'll talk about that too. And realize the higher levels of confidence. I must say confidence is probably what 90% of my clients have to deal with, have issues with their confidence. And I think from a generational standpoint, and I'm not knocking you guys, believe me, I'm the biggest advocate for your generation because I'm a little bit older than you guys, but I think the impact social media has plays into that a great deal. Yeah, everybody's not in here. I can appreciate the transparency and being honest. And um, I was influenced by it, too. I almost probably had a mental breakdown several years ago before I got into sports psychology because I got caught in that rabbit hole of social media and going down that hole, and that happens a lot. Because the worst thing you got to do is look, look what she did. She's doing this. She's doing that. But you got to remember, you know, you can take a 1,000 selfies to get the perfect shot. And people only post their victories but never post their failures. Somebody's going to post when they drop red wine on their white suit? No. Unless they're just drunk and they do that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> but I'm saying that we don't do that. So you got to keep that in mind that whatever image you're seeing, you're seeing the most perfected, concocted image to represent that individual. So just keep that in mind, okay? And then don't look at yourself and say, well, what am I doing? Mindfulness is very important. Uh, I jumped too quick. Mindfulness is very important. That's one of the principles that's helped me through my transition and something that my sports psychology practice is based on. John kabat he defined mindfulness as it's a long definition, but I'll break it down. The awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. Two things you got to take from this long sentence. Paying attention on purpose and being non-judgmental. Can you be present? I don't mean here, I'm here, but can you be present in the moment? Everyone that I'm looking at, except for Chelsea, is paying attention right now. Everyone is. He is, too. I'm just messing with it, right? Everyone. It's locked in. I see that. I sense that. That's really hard in a very exciting environment like sports, that you're talking to someone, you're trying to develop a relationship, and all this stuff is going on around, or the person who feels that they're just like the political person, they're shaking your hand and looking behind you to see who's coming in next. I'm telling you right now, it's not worth it. It's not worth it trying to work the whole room when you can be better off building a relationship with one person. And that's pretty hard sometimes. Looking them in the eye, or a trick I'll show you guys, <laughs> look at their nose. They'll never know the difference, and you might be freaked out by looking people in the eye sometimes. And then shake their hand and squeeze it like they owe you some money. So you're always locked in and doing it, and you can set yourself aside. Okay, but also being non-judgmental. That goes back to my previous statement about the impact social media has on us. Can you look at someone and not judge? It's not easy because we're just raised to judge. We look at someone based on what they wear, what they say, how they sound, and we come to a conclusion. But can you just let the thought pass through? That's something I talked to with a lot of my athletes. That one young lady who was competing for a spot on the U.S. Olympics, uh, the 200-meter relay. She at one time was one of the top 10 uh, highest-running 200-meter persons in the world, you know. And we talk about being able to let the things pass through. See, sometimes we have emotions that get us, guys. And we don't want to address it. We don't want to deal with it. We don't even want to think about it because we feel it's just going to sit there. But I tell you, whatever that emotion is, address it. Let it happen. Let it come and pass through. It's been said that one of the hardest things for a man or woman to do, Paige, is to sit alone in a room with their thoughts because of the fear of all the things that are going to come to mind. It's like I don't want to have to think about that. But I tell my clients, and I'm telling you guys, if you can get to the point where you can say, I can think about it. It doesn't define who I am, and I can let the thought pass. And I've gotten great feedback about that, and that's something to think about, too, because some, we're so worried that we're going to think about something that's horrific or tragic or traumatic, as opposed to saying, okay, just let it pass through. The thought came and it went. That was a quick 
statement on that. We'll come back to something like that in a second. Now, who's using mindfulness? Google used it with this employees. The Mayo Clinic used it. My Marines used it when I was on the rifle range struggling. We were uh, taking deep breath. You let it go for my hunters out there and Columbia Business School, and now you. This brief conversation we had about this is enough to get you started down the track. So how, how is that? Okay, we'll do it like this. Okay, on the count of three, I want everyone to take a deep breath. Okay, one, two, three. I let it out. Okay, that's good. Now this time when we do it, I want you to breathe in all the positive things you want in your life and blow out all the negative. Okay? <clears throat> On the count of three. One, two, three. Feels good, right? It's real simple. Many of you probably can't remember the last time you took a deep breath. Because y'all are hustling, you're working, you're running. Max is getting ready, getting ready for the speaker. You're getting ready to do all your stuff. And just society is telling us, go, go, go. Uh, Coach Izzo and Coach uh, Stevens, a real good friend of mine, he talks about Coach Izzo tells his players when they come to the hotel, take a deep breath. Because breathing is like oxygen to the brain. And it's virtually impossible to take a deep breath and focus on other things. So when you need to center, we need to calm down, you need to relax, just take that deep breath. I tell my golfers, you can sometimes put a red dot on your glove as a reminder to stay present. Look at that and, say, and stay back in the moment. Because we get so caught up in just running and doing all these things that we forget to be able to bring ourselves back and stay present. So when I say that, just taking a deep breath. You guys are on your way to mindfulness. Now, I'll be sure to send this information to Max if you guys want to pull from it, too. Got flow in the zone. That's the goal. I got a future client I was just talking to today, as a matter of fact, talking about being in the zone. His uh, coach told him that uh, you're great when you're in the zone. He says, I know I am, but I just don't know how to stay there. And I'm here to tell you with the things I'm going to share in the next few slides, there's a way you can set yourself up where your whole life can be in the zone. I'm like, how is that? And I say I'm an example of the fact that I can stand in front of you now. Here at my alma mater, Max being a good judge of character, doing his research, say this guy might be someone worth speaking to because he saw my body of work and what I've been doing. To have a relationship with someone like Chelsea because we spent time doing other things in the same vein, working together, that speaks to that. And I just want you guys to know you can set yourself up for that. Now, if you need clarity on what the zone is, imagine getting up in the morning, and trying to go to class, and you got a flat tire or a ticket, you know, uh, you spill your coffee or your food, everything is just bumbling along the way. Now, newsflash, that is not the zone, okay? That's not the zone. The zone is the opposite of that. You get up in the morning, everything's happening like you need to happen, you walk in class right on time, you get the grades you want, you make the connection you need, everything is smooth. It's like a movie. And I believe that if you have the right kind of mindset, with the things you do starting in the morning, you can set yourself up for that life. I have a thing now. If I have to rush, I'm not going. I don't want you to go to your first job and not show like, our speaker told us if we got to rush, don't come. No, I'm not saying that. But if I'm in a situation where I have to put too much extra effort into doing something, I might be doing one thing too much. And I work on bringing that back. So all my movements now are deliberate. Perfect example, when I came down here, I finished up some work today around 3 Went home, got a little bit of rest because i just been running all week long, which is fine. I'll get my rest. Got into town enough time to relax, change clothes, walk around. I walk, We walked past the room. I said, this is the room right here. They said, oh, because I've been here. And I've been doing my thing for a while. And you want to be in a situation that you're not rushing into the room, rushing to the meeting. You want to be able to get somewhere in enough time to sit down and relax. Because guess what? Stuff happens. Stuff happens. Detours, you know, misinformation. And you don't want to be always just running by the seat of your pants. So with that, you can be in the zone, whether it's in your professional work or whether it's in your sports work. And we'll talk about that right now. Now, one thing they say about you guys as a generation, I call you guys your age and lower, is that you're not mentally tough. And this is a quote by Jim Harbaugh. I spent a lot of time with Jim Harbaugh. Uh, he's a great guy. He's fun. I wish they could be more successful. I don't want to start any... Michigan, Michigan State <laughs> stuff, but you know, no, no, he he he's he, he's a motivating type guy, and uh, I think his record isn't really reflecting that. But we we've spent a lot of good times talking about things. This was a recent interview. If you go on my web, oh, you go on my website or my YouTube channel, 
SBS Edge, you can see this. And what you can't see is him grabbing my leg under the table because what he was just excited and talking. I'm like, all right, coach, I got you, I got you. But he talks about not being mentally tough, and I kind of allude to that when I talked about the impact social media can have uh, and basically having helicopter parents and snowplow parents who clear the way. Now, I don't know your personal situation. That may not be the case. But society is such that so many people make a way so that we don't have to struggle. But the struggle is where your character is built. Some of you may say, the hell with character. I just don't want to struggle. But there will be a time where you will be faced with a task that you haven't had to deal with before. My first struggle came when I came here, because I didn't go to Western as a freshman. I transferred as a sophomore. I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta. Same here, right? What's your name, buddy? Awesome. Awesome. Where'd you transfer from? Uh, OCC. OCC. Got it. I went to Morehouse as a freshman. Dr. King went there. Spike Lee went there. Samuel Jackson. It was just, oh, Lindsay, you're going to Morehouse. That's wonderful. Well, Morehouse cost like $20,000 20-plus years ago. And I'm a first-generation college student, so we didn't really know what college cost was. I got down there, met my little girlfriend, and got my little heart broke. I had to come back here. But fortunately, I followed uh, Dr. Jennifer, the late Dr. Jennifer. She had told us to always have a backup school. And I applied to Western on a hump. And I remember coming up here to visit my freshman. I was like, this is kind of cool. And next thing you know, boom, I'm coming to Western. But when I came here, so many great opportunities happened. So fast forward. When I had some things happen in my life and some changes, some rough things happened, I thought back to this moment. When I came to Western, as much as I hated having to leave Atlanta, leave my girlfriend, and leave all these people to come here, this is one of those first monumental moments and challenges that I had. So now when I have those moments, I think back to these moments and how I got through it. Nothing is going to serve you better than having a struggle. You may say, this is tripping. He wants us to struggle, but you got to go through that if you want something. How are you going to be one of 30 interns for a Major League Baseball or NBA or NFL opportunity and you haven't had to struggle? How are you going to be somebody who has to burn the midnight oil to make something happen? How are you going to be the one where they come in and say, you know what, sorry, Paige, we're shutting this whole division down. You got two weeks. And you never struggled before? How are you going to respond to that? How are you going to stand in front of your children and say, this is how you deal with that? So what I'm saying, I'm not telling you to go walk out into the street walk into traffic. But I'm telling you that when an opportunity presents itself that's going to bring a little challenge to you, don't run away from it. Because the only people who are successful are the people who've overcome struggles. You can't tell me someone who's made it to the top of their profession or just really made an impact on the world and they haven't had to struggle. So don't run from that. There's another word I want to bring up that should not be in the dictionary, and that word is safety. That word shouldn't exist because there's nothing that's safe. Nothing is safe. Your job isn't safe. Hell, your relationship may even be safe. It's not. So don't think that you can set your life up to have all this cushion, no matter what I'll be set. No. Teachers get fired and laid off. Real estate bubbles burst. There is no safety. You have to be ready to respond to any and everything that happens in the world. And you have to start to project. I'm so glad that when I went to that meeting in Atlanta, I said, you know what, this thing is about to end. And instead of me just trying to hold on and hold on, I said, what's my next move, man? I'm in my late 30s. I've been doing this corporate thing, lobbying. I'm tired of it. Yeah, I make a lot of money. I'm just tired of these dudes. Talking to these folks like talking to Charlie Brown's teacher. Womp, 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 womp. I was tired. But I said, I want to get into this sports thing. I was just like, you guys said, but man, it's going to be a hard way to go. It's like everybody wants to be in sports. So what are you going to do that's different? And I'm so thankful that I started on that road because it's got me where I am right now. I want to make sure I'm mindful of time. So we're going to maybe 7.30 or 8? Okay, we're good. We're good. Oh, you guys are still with me too. Now, why is it important? Because life can change in an instant. That was my car. Not the accident, is that 90 seconds prior that my daughter was in the car. I just dropped her off at daycare. And I get emotional now, but I'm gonna push through this part. I just dropped her off at daycare, came out the driveway, made a right turn and another right turn, and all of a sudden I see the side of this Buick too close to me. Because this elderly lady ran a red light and T-boned. Thank goodness. My Kia Optima, which I wasn't really happy to get the car when I got it. I'm so thankful 
that it, 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 it saved my life. Because when I got to the hospital, I showed them the pictures. They said, who died? And then I thought about my daughter being in there and the fact that she wasn't in there. So, yeah, I got jammed up. I got jacked up in the car accident. Walked away from it, fortunately. So that was one thing. I was doing uh, physical therapy. My spine was all out of whack. And the sinus system was all jammed up. So I, I was kind of going through a thing. Couldn't play any ball. Couldn't work out. My clothes was fitting funny. My wife was like, oh, you losing weight, huh? My clothes was fitting funny. It was just a whole lot, right? And then April 4th, I got a phone call from my six-figure job saying, we're shutting down. They said, do you want to take a severance package or you want to work three more months? I'm like, screw you. Give me my money. I'm out. But fortunately, I was already in the mindset that I want to make my own move anyway. And that's how you got to think out here, especially for your generation. Because there's no such thing as big titles and big money. They don't come together anymore. This great title with all this money, it just doesn't come like this. They want people in the media to do the interview, shoot the video, edit it, shoot it up, and, and do all these things. So you got to be able to do all these things to bring value to a situation, to be able to command the kind of money you want and the lifestyle you want, right? And then by July 27th, I think by then I was done with the organization. I was off to something else. But look how fast things change. In an accident, <clears throat> now I'm looking like, where am I going next? You know, what am I going to do? And all these other things are happening. That's why you really got to be ready, guys. You don't want things like this to happen and to stop you. These are the things that should release you. These are the things that should liberate you. You should better say, okay, well, I got an opportunity for something new now. Because we get so caught up on this track. And really, probably up until now, from high school to now, you guys are on the track. Okay, I'm going to go to high school, finish high school, obviously. I'm going to finish college. I'm going to do this. But as soon as you step outside this campus and start this quote-unquote real world things, all kind of stuff gets topsy-turvy. And your world is thrown around because you haven't been used to something being like that. Now, the 10-minute miracle, what really saved me? This is something I coined. When I start with a new athlete, and sometimes I lose them before I even start. Because the first thing I ask them is, what's the relationship like with your phone? And they give me a weird look. They're like, what do you want to say about my phone? What's your relationship like with your phone? And I'm not judging. I'm not judging. Because everything I'm talking about, I went through myself. But in most cases, when we go to sleep, our phone is, is within what? One arm's distance, or probably about six inches, right? No judgment here. It's right there. Through the night, we're looking at it. We're checking it. Man, how much sleep did we miss out on because of that? So what I talk about is what I've been doing probably for the last five years. I'm going to show you the benefit of that. For the first 10 minutes a day, I don't touch my phone. It's to the point where I don't even sleep with my phone. I leave my phone in my home office. Because I figure I'm there with my wife, my daughter's in her room, or she's in our bed, whatever. That's another conversation. Uh, so I don't have it. So when I go to sleep, I can really go to sleep. Now, you may say, what about emergency? Well, I got my wife right there. My mom's in Detroit. Hey, they're going to have to just get through the night without you, okay? And then whatever you think you may be missing on social media, think about it, you're really not. People are texting on a group page or whatever they're doing, and you're not in on it. Hey, <laughs> when I was here on campus, I was a very social guy. And I learned early on, the more you're not around, the more people miss you. So if you can take breaks from that, that's going to help you. So when I start my day, what we do sometimes, we start our day and we have this right here. And you got all this information in here affecting your subconscious. You're looking at stuff and you don't know, oh, that was garbage, but you're still thinking about it. It's right there. It's right there before you start your day. Sometimes you wonder why you get up feeling irritated. Well, you've been letting all this stuff flow around because you've been glancing at it at night, you've been thinking about it, it's constantly and it's repetitive. So what I like to do is cleanse my palate in the morning. So for the first four minutes of the day, and I just go through so many legal paths with this, I write down what I'm grateful for. I'm not being cheesy. What's the importance of gratitude? Because when you show gratitude, you're bringing more opportunities into your life. And secondly, when you show gratitude, you really realize how good your life is. And we can sit right here and be mad that we didn't get a position we wanted, we didn't get the grade we wanted, didn't get the job, et cetera, et cetera. But when you start writing out what you're grateful for, I'm grateful for my friends, my family, my home, my education. You're like, oh, I'm doing really good. And that really helps. And then for the next four minutes, I write affirmations. This is so cool. Because the affirmations are writing what you want as if you have them already. And that's going to go back to a statement I made earlier. We're very careful not to talk about things that we want for fear that if we put it out there and we don't get it, we failed ourselves. 
But you got to write down all these beautiful titles you guys are talking about. Nick, especially with what we were talking about, you're going to say that, hey, my program is going to be adopted by all sports media platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to talk about it because when you do that, and if you're a believer in this concept, you start drawing those things to you subconsciously. I had experience. Anyone ever rode one of those segways? They stand up straight, right? Freaked me out years ago when I was with the governor. I was doing her advance work. So I was always responsible for making sure she didn't look a fool, do something that could show up on television and be a bad look. So they wanted her to ride the Segway, and I was very nervous about that. Like, oh, I don't know. It's not a good look. I don't know how these things work. He said, come on, come on. You ride it first. I said, okay. So I got on it, and I stood on it. He said, okay, I want you to think about coming towards me. And I started thinking about going towards him, and it started moving, right? I was like, no. I'm like, no. This, this, there's no way me thinking about this is going to happen. But what happened is this. There are ball bearings, as some of you may know, in the base of that. So when I started thinking about moving forward, subconsciously, subconsciously, I began to lean forward. Just enough not to know it, because if he would have told me to lean forward, I would have fell on my face. But subconsciously, I started leaning forward. And I think that's the best way to talk about affirmations. When you start putting these things out here, subconsciously, you start pushing towards that. And I'm a firm believer that it works, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And then for the last two minutes, I meditate and pray, and even with my players, I have them do a pre or post during games and practices. And then I'm ready for the world. I can look at emails. I can look at social media because I've already cleansed my palate. And from an investment standpoint, we're in the Hayworth College of Business. I've invested in myself first. I put what I needed into me first. No filter, just exactly what I needed for me. Because what do we do most of the time? We get up in the morning, we check emails, we respond to other people, and we give the rest of the world our best. We save the leftovers for ourselves. That's some bullshit. Excuse me. But if you think about that, you give the world everything else. Sure, 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 sure. And then you come up short. As opposed to getting up in the morning, focusing on you, putting yourself out there, and then go forward to give the world your most confident self, your most visual self, you know, your most ready for the world self, okay? Shut me down, so I was talking too long. It's gonna come up in a second. Now, why did that work out good? It's gonna pop up in a second. How did that work out for me? Hello to everyone on social media. <laughs> so by me doing that, and that trip I made now, you can't see it from here. Page, I have to be the visual witness. That little ball head, that's me. <laughs> and while this says 2016, this is a flyer. This really was the year 2015, right? <clears throat> Where I made that trip. My life is like a blur. I would not have known what year that was if it wasn't for this. So that's when I made that trip to Vegas, right? And at the time, I think Coach Calipari may have been speaking, which was pretty cool, right? So I'm sitting in this audience. I knew I coached before. We're going to talk about that. I know there's some coaches out here or potential coaches. But I, I was like, but I got the sports psychology thing. I'm like, where do I fit in? But through the things I just shared with you, the 10-minute miracle, talking about what I wanted, how I want the future to be, all that, by 2016, I was one of the speakers. So within a year's time, for me just showing up there, following my heart and desire, the work I was doing as a sports psychology consultant, and this is Don Showalter. He's won so many uh, under-19 gold medals all over the world. He's no joke. He's a good friend. Mike Jones, he's a coach at the legendary the math. That's where Markel Fultz went. And all these guys go, and I'm right here on the panel with them. I traveled the entire country with them for several years doing that, be a part of that. And this all came from me saying at a bar one day, what do I want? So if I could sit there at a bar and say, what do I want in this USA basketball, and I'm part of the USA basketball family, what can you guys do? What can you set your goals for? I think the biggest challenge we have, we're scared to set goals. Coach Harbaugh told me, you got to set big goals. Goals so big, people think you're crazy. Because if you set a goal and they say, oh, that's good, your goal is not big enough. Your goal has to stretch you beyond your comfort zone. Because after a while, you're going to need something that's so big and so daring, that's the only thing that's going to keep you motivated. Because playing the safe stand right here, there's no, nobody wants that. Nobody wants to hire the person who can play it safe. These big leagues that got people from all over the world, not just Michigan or the Midwest trying to work in these offices, they don't need people to come in who just want to stay in this space. They need big thinkers. They need people that can bring things to the table and have things going on already. So I give that as a brief example of how 
that thinking, that Tim and the Miracle changed my life. And from that, I've gone on to speak to elementary and middle school athletes, high school athletes, and college students, too. This is a couple years ago. That's Jaron Jackson, went top of the draft. That's Sean Rushman. You guys may not remember him. He played for Michigan State. But uh, Jack Hoiberg, I love Jack. His dad is Fred Hoiberg, who's the coach for the Bulls, now coach for Nebraska. Quato, Matt McQuay, he's playing over, I think, in Germany. Kyle Arms, that's Connor, that's Connor George in the back right there. Yeah, and this is just a typical day, me hanging out with the guys over at State, and that was a couple years ago. But now, present day, this is our media day the other day. X, that's my guy, great young man. Father, husband, cash is really good. I just got a text about him a second ago, so I want some tickets to the game. They call me for tickets a lot. And this is my brand, and this was my video that I did, and I think that's important because I talked about earlier, you got to better bring a lot of things to the table. The people that I'm working with now, they call me like, oh, you're so good at that social media. I'm like, am I? But it's just, it's just by nature we do that. So to be able to cut and paste and put things together, and uh, some of the things I put up have kind of made up on the national news sometimes. I've seen the things I put together, and my quotes come up because of that. So that's another skill set you want to continue to work on. And even work with professional athletes in Hall of Famers. That's Gary Payton right there. GP, baby. Hall of Fame. My guy, Derek Coleman. This is uh, 1990 NBA draft, one and two. Number one and number two. And ironically, this is in Detroit at my old high school, Henry Ford. I was interviewing him. Now, me and Derek, we had a tumultuous relationship. Derek is all the 6'10 and can be mean as a rattlesnake to deal with him. But we got a relationship where it can be love, hate, because I'm one of the people who will tell Derek, no, Derek, that's not right. And because he's superstar celebrity he's used to getting people just to respond to him we end up having a better relationship so the best thing you can do if you want to go to sports is be authentic and honest with people they got enough people already who go say yep you're right but being authentic and honest and respectful will keep you going a long long way gary payton that's my guy fun time that interview is on my site this is my broadcast partner jack elba he's a great guy great mentor that's my guy miles uh at moneyball the moneyballs tournament you know miles went uh, number 12 in the 2018 draft and worked with him a lot when he was over at state and some things that we talked about more of a personal nature, but you know, Miles was the man, but he still had his things he had to struggle through. Okay. Doing good. <laughs> Wisconsin game, right? So this is what the quote was, his response to a question about, did he make the right decision with the offense? This is called D'Antonio, by the way. This is me right in front of the press conference. His response was like, that's sort of a dumbass question. So when I posted that and did that, when we were on Fox 47 the next night, it ended up being what they used to talk about. I'm like, that's my stuff. So you get to the point where you want to be able to have your stuff working across the board. But that was pretty good. You see, it was pissed off, something like that. But you know, that's part of what comes with it. And then that's Coach D'Antonio out another time having deep conversations and everything's about mental toughness. So my niche is mental toughness. What's your niche going to be? What's going to be your lane? Sometimes we think about, well, I want to be able to do all this stuff. That's cool. You want to be good. But what is someone going to pick up the phone when they have an issue and call you for it? They say they know you're the guy. I've been able to be at the point that whether it's friends, family, anyone who need help with someone with mental toughness, they I mean, you should call Lindsay. Or I've had other people on the basketball team say, hey, I need some help. Oh, you should call my guy Lindsay. Now, what are you going to do when they're going to say they should call you? Now, that's a challenge because – you can kind of go with the masses or go with what sounds like it is. Go with that thing that makes your heart beat a little faster. The things that make your stomach jump a little bit. That thing that makes you bubble. And it may be something that you're on the very ground floor of that. Or sub-basement. You may be here with it. But it excites you. It excites you. That's it. Because it's not about when you get there. It's just always going on and going on. So I encourage you with that. You guys are doing really good. It's a horrible picture, Coach Izzo, but that was something we did recently. I had to change something. Well, what happened is the way I pulled it off, whatever, and I was going to try to change it, but I was talking to Nick and Max Joe, so it was their fault that I couldn't change it. That's what you guys write. But uh, it was so funny. This is an interesting story, a true story. So Izzo and I had known each other over the years, right? But this was the first time I interviewed him. So we got on the headset. We went through the interview, and I was able to so cool. I was able to bring up old stuff. I was like, yeah, when I watched you guys play North Carolina, for the championship in Detroit years ago, that's when I know the difference between Midwest recruiting and national recruiting. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So when the interview was done, he got off and he took the head. He was like, damn, you're good. And it wasn't patronizing. 
he was like, he was seeing a different side of me. So now when I interview him, he's like, Lindsay, what you got? Because he knows where we're going to go. So that just comes with time. And these relationships don't come easy. That's another thing, too, guys. If you want to get in this sports thing, and you got your eyes set on certain teams, players, it takes time to build those relationships. Kobe Altman, uh, general manager for the Cleveland Cavaliers, my guy, he looks out for me when I met him the USA Basketball. We both were speakers at one time. So when he was there, I was like, oh, Kobe Altman's going to be I want to go talk to him. So I go up to him, Chelsea. I'm like, hey, man. He said, I want to talk to you. I'm like, okay. And um, excuse the bleeps and whatnot, but he goes, uh, how do I get a guy like you to come talk to my guys without them thinking they're fucked up? And I was like, and I'm just thinking, LeBron was just playing with you and all these other guys. And I was like, whoa. And I was like, well, my response was, you need a gym rat. You need somebody who's going to be in the gym all the time. Because what I learned about this profession is, in many cases, people are very, very clinical. They come in and say, hey, uh, any of you guys want to talk about psychology? And they were like, no, beat it. And I got another friend who used to work with the cat. He said, yeah, man, the psychologist would come in, and it would be like this fishbowl type room, and they would sit there, and none of the players wanted to talk to me. So what I would do is stay. I would be a gym rat, man. I would just be in there, being around. That's what Coach Izzo gave me advice years ago. I said, Coach, this is what I got. He said, man, just keep coming around. I said, what? He said, yep, just keep coming around. If somebody say you can come on around, and that's something you enter in, you got to go. Don't let your friends talk you out of something because you don't get paid for it. Because the killer is you may end up getting paid for it, and the payment may be crap. And you may be better served just to leverage having a relationship. See, that's where a lot of people go. You getting paid for it? You getting paid? Probably not. But you better off building this relationship. We were talking earlier about, well, how do you do the work you do? You got to finance the dream. Some of you guys will have to do some work totally opposite of what you want to do to pay for what you need. Yeah, heard some amens on that one. And sometimes there's a conflict internally because you're like, well, this is not what I got a degree for. This is not it. But that's how the hustle go. None of you guys go find any success. You can't get no hustle. And a lot of you don't really have that, that gear to kick in yet because you've had so many things taken care of for you. Whether I'm talking to people in this group, people on social media, or somebody. But you got to have that hustle. You got to better just show up. But that's why you want to do something you're passionate about. <laughs> when Jack tells me, yo, we got to go to Wisconsin, I'm like, bet. So I'm on track to be the only media member to hit all of Michigan State's football games home and away. I'm going to go to Rutgers and all that because these guys are, and some people be in Maui or whatnot. But my point being is I'm down to put that work in. And you can say you want this title and you want to work for this organization, but if you can't show a body of work that you're showing up, investing, sometimes you got to pay. Sometimes, whether that's parking, gas, you're investing in your future. You're investing in yourself. What we say on social media, you're betting on yourself. So if you're not willing to tell, and also it's going to let you know what your friends are like. But let me tell you now, your, your relationships are going to change. They're going to go up and down. They may be circular. They may make their way back. You're going to have people you're cool with now, and for whatever reason, going to go in a different direction. What I say to my homeboys, I say, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you at the top. Meaning, go do what you got to do. They do what they got to do, and we'll meet up. Because if you get into that whole, remember the movie Step Brothers? When they were like interviewing together. If you get into that whole thing, it's not going to work. Because no one's going to be moving at the same speed you're moving at all the time. So keep that in mind. But uh, it's a great relationship with Coach Izzo. Uh, it's a really good feeling when a Hall of Fame coach knows you for who you are. But that didn't come easy. That come with us having our back and forth. And to be honest, someone like Izzo appreciates it when you don't just lay down, when you push back. Because power does that. When someone's used to being able to get what they want when they want, they're going to take advantage of it until you say no. Now, what principles are you standing on? Right now is the time to develop those character principles that are important to you. Okay, I'll do anything, but I'm not going to do this. And when opportunities come, you got to say, well, I got to walk away from it. So you got to keep that in mind. We're doing really good. We're going to make sure we get some time for some questions, too. Now, uh, I'm going to go back just to make sure. Oh, okay, why is this important? It's going to pop up. Now, you guys may know that Michigan State basketball preseason, number one, even though my guy Josh is going to be out, Josh texted me, yes, sir, no, good stuff. Josh, uh, we were texting just yesterday, and he's in wonderful spirits. He texted me back some things, showing he's in good spirits. But they are off Twitter. The team is off Twitter. We're going to get off Twitter. We're going to focus on getting this done. And it's funny because Izzo hates Twitter. He hates social media. He feels that he was distracted. So that's a perfect transition for what we're talking about. 
for this generation of athletes, what do my clients do? They deal with distractions, conflict, and anxiety. So much anxiety going on. Because you see things you're like, oh, I'm not doing what I need to do. I looked on social media, and this is happening. You get all this anxiety, and that's a big issue. It comes from social media. Now, social media can be a double-edged sword. It was great when you guys put that up. You know, Lindsay Hellis is going to be the first speaker. And I was able to put that out in the world. That was great. But sometimes you look at other things, it can really hurt you and bring you down. So I want to go through this really quick. This is really interesting. You want to talk about the generations. And my belief that each generation has a different cultural value that kind of distinguishes it. You had the GI generation from 01 to 24. They went off to the war. The silent generation, 25 to 42. We always hear about the baby boomers, right? Everybody talks about the baby, 43 to 60. Generation X, that would be me. What, what, year, what year were you born? You okay, so you guys are millennials, but I, I still think that we all kind of have some of the same cultural values, whatnot. And then you got this homeland global. I don't know what that's about, but you know. <laughs> but, but here's the big thing. This is for my coaches. Who's all interested in maybe coaching? Right? Oh, awesome, awesome, great. Almost have to, right? Check this out. This is what I talk about when I talk to USA Basketball about coaching. Let me just go to the next slide. This generation of athletes. Praise is their currency. Praise is their currency. Okay? And the reason why that's important, because my generation, the Izzos of the world, I, I call them the fire and brimstone type coaches, they didn't give praise because they grew up under this scenario. Around this time, people coming home from the war, dads didn't hug their sons, they shook their hands, you know, they didn't say, I'm proud of you until. They got married, so it was very, uh, there was a very emotional disconnect. So these guys end up coaching us. So those same values were passed down. That's why I can scream and shout when I coach my guys, because that's the generational value I had. But this generation is different. And when I noticed this, it was I was embedded with a football team for a season match. Embedded to the point where I was in film with them. And I was all in, right? Film on a Saturday morning. I'll never forget the coach was going through, and this one guy's kind of quiet. Actually, he's playing for Ball State right now. He may get a chance to go to the league. And I remember the coach saying off the video, hey, Johnny, you did a you did a good job on that block. And I remember just watching him put his head up, <coughs> kind of straighten his back. I said, wow. It was that giving up that little bit of praise. Now, the challenge with that is coaches from my generation don't give praise easily. They won't give it up. Oh, you're supposed to do that. But praise is this generation's currency. A perfect example is a lot of you, your dad, your dad's not going to come and say, hey, thanks for taking out the garbage. He's not going to do that. He's going to say you're supposed to do it. But what I tell people from that generation, instead of saying thanks for taking out the garbage, which you just don't want to do because it conflicts with your values, say something like, I'm really proud of you about how you're being more responsible around the house. See, if you're going to coach, you're going to have to be able to ride the wave between your generational values and this generation, their values, especially for this group. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to coach anybody younger than you right now, you're going to pull your hair out because they're going to be so extreme in their actions. But there's a good chance your values are connected to an older generation and theirs are not. Perfect example, texting about coming to practice or not. Some coaches won't even text. I'm not texting. You better call me. But well, people don't call anymore. People don't talk on the phone. You know, so you got to keep those things in mind as far as what happens. And also, if praise is their currency as a coach, you must adjust for inflation. And that's what I mean by instead of saying something like, oh, thanks for taking out the garbage, we'll make an adjustment. Say, hey, thanks for being responsible. And that's what you got to do. And the only way you can adjust for inflation, the only way you can know the right formula is by time spent. Coach Izzo will tell you that right there. We talk, we talk about that all the time. The reason I'm able to do what I do because I spend time with my players. Everyone see that big blow up with Aaron Henry last season in the, in the, in the championship, well, in the uh, NCAA, and he and I talked about it all the time. He was like, I can talk to them like that because I spend time with them. Now, the national media had a field day with him. They were saying, oh, these coaches and all that. And to be honest, it's funny. Tom Izzo represents fire and brimstone. He's kind of grandfathered in. But none of you guys can walk into a coaching job right now or a future athletic director and say, I coach like Tom Izzo. 
think you're going to get a job. You're not. But he's still kind of considered the standard. So for guys and gals going into coaching, you really got to be able to be the gap filler between the older generations and their values for what your athletic director may want and still being able to reach these young people, if that makes any sense. And that's hard because you're going to have challenges to yourself personally. You're going to have things that you probably don't agree with that you got to kind of find middle ground on. And so many people are getting out of coaching because they feel that this generation of athletes is so extreme. But you guys are in a good spot because you're not too far removed from it. So I encourage that. If you guys want to go into co coaching, you'll be very thankless. And you're not going to get rich. Your time is on makes millions, but for the longest, he wasn't making anything. And believe me, by the time you get that payoff, you had a whole different phase in your life. So if you want to go into coaching, I encourage it. I encourage that in your relationships that you look at being around people or getting in relation with people who can understand and relate, that when you're gone, you're not going because you're doing something inappropriate, that when the game is over at a certain time and you're not home, you may be taking Johnny home. You may be getting Johnny a bite to eat. Johnny may need to talk. And it's really like no set hours. It's really a lifestyle. Am I right, Chelsea? It's a lifestyle. Okay. Doing good. You guys are doing good. A few more slides. Here's one thing I want to say in continuation of the other slide about mindsets. Scarcity versus abundance. People with a scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing recognition, credit, and power. A lot of older generations like that. They don't want to give up the power. They want to share. But they feel that things are so tight. But think about it. If you grew up right after the Great Depression, where the only thing you had in the cover was some pork and beans, you're going to be like, eat everything on a plate. This is all you have, and this is it. No frills. But we are kind of experienced the abundance. People with an abundance mentality resort in sharing of prestige, recognition, profits, and decision making. You don't mind giving up the love and all that. So again, if you want to coach or whatever you want to do, you have to find that middle ground. And that goes back to mindfulness and being non-judgmental for someone who has these views. I can't stand him. Such a tightwad when it comes to these things. Well, they can't help the way they were raised, and what influences they had, and what trauma they may have had. But you want to be able to step back and kind of understand and grasp it and to be able to add your other part, too. Doing good. Now, SBS Edge 12 Rules of Flow. I'll go through these briefly, and I'll emphasize one. These are the 12 Rules of Flow I emphasize with my clients that I work with. And I think these are the things that can get you to that point where it's like you're living a life where you catch every green light when you're driving. First thing is goal setting. We talked about that. you got to set some big, huge goals. You can't say my goal is just to make it. Your goal got to be to exceed that. Imagery is very important. That's what I did with USA Basketball. I sat down and I had to think about something I really wanted. The mental rehearsal part is very important. A lot of you may have issues in your relations with people, but you can really do this. If you know who you're dealing with and their personality, why don't you play out the conversation two or three steps? If you know this person is a certain way, and when you bring something up, you know what they're going to say, take it a couple steps further. Play a little chess with it. Mentally rehearse what's going to happen so you can get to the point and you can get the outcome you want because you know what they're going to do. Positive self-talk. You got to be your own cheerleader sometimes. Because unfortunately, it's a lot of negativity going around. And people are quick to be negative before they're positive. It's almost like they reserve that positivity. So talk good about yourself. Breathing relaxation techniques. We experienced that a little while ago. You did guys a great job with that. Concentration exercises. Sometimes... Uh, what I do is I, when I put my daughter to sleep and I'm sitting in the chair right next to her bed, I count backwards from 100 just to be able to slow my mind down and focus on concentration. <laughs> I had a client say, well, I can't. I can't. I need to count from 1,000. I said, okay, fine. Count from 1,000, whatever you need to do, right? But just taking that moment and counting backwards helps slow the brain down. Or open up a book and count every word on the page just to put yourself in a position that you're slowing your brain down to help you with your concentration. The other things you can do too, emotional control, oh my goodness. <clears throat> Easier said than done. I think I've done much better in my personal life with emotional control, but sometimes you have to catch yourself in that deep breathing can help you do that. Maintaining proper motivation. I'm gonna have a jet. Whether it's net jets, whether I own it, my favorite show is selling jets, because why do I need a jet? Why do I need a G4? Because with a G4, I could put a whole team on there I can consult with them, have my family on there, and just have everything. So it's justifiable. But that's what I'm going to get, and that's what I'm working towards. You can get a ride if you want. Max, Nick, I keep you guys connected. Chelsea, I don't know. I'm All right? <laughs> I'll carry your back. Yes, but maintain proper motivation. And sometimes you can't share your dreams with everybody. 
See, what happened is we had these exciting dreams and visions, and you want to share, you want somebody to do like this. They're not feeling you. You know why? They may not be where they need to be in their life. They may not be in a position, Max, where they can say, I feel you with that, because they're not confident. They're not having that moment. They didn't go hear a speaker and get inspired and come home and say, look at what I'm doing. They may be at a different place. So don't feel bad when someone can't get on board for yours, okay? But if you got somebody who responds to you and says, man, you should do it, girl, that's great. You keep that person in mind. That person with good support. Forming healthy habits. I am not here to judge, cause judgment. It's college life. It's day. Hey, you want to have a healthy lifestyle, okay? Because I tell you what, this sports life, I've changed my whole, my whole body clock now because I may be coming in from Wisconsin, at three in the morning, and you gotta get up and do a taping at another time. I just work on getting my rest. So if you wanna get into this sports life, there are no hours that you can say I'm focused on. Just get your rest, stay healthy, and do it like that. Getting quality sleep. You know, college time, I don't wanna be up late, but you wanna get to the point where you can give your body some sleep, your body can start recognizing, okay, it's time to go to bed, I can shut it down, and you work on it. I know this is probably the most unique time of your life right now, because everybody's kind of moving at the same pace, but you wanna make sure you get uh, some quality to see. But this is the one I'll focus on as we get ready to wrap up. Is there any slide that's important? This is the most important one. What do people always say? If I can just survive, if I can just get by, if I can just do a little bit. No, you want to thrive under pressure. Imagine being at the free throw line for a state championship basketball game. Two free throws win the state championship. Is that pressure? Absolutely that's pressure. What happens if you hit those two free throws? Legendary. Your purpose is on the other side of the pressure. Your purpose is on the other side of the pressure. So bring the pressure on. You want to thrive under pressure. Pressure means there's an opportunity. That pressure being on the free throw line means if, dude, if I hit these, I'm a legend. And I feel good about hitting them because I've been practicing. So don't look at pressure as something that is going to hold you back. And don't be a weakling saying, if I can just get by. Say, oh, it's a pressure? That's, that's an opportunity. Something's about to open up. And if you think like that, if you approach things like that, you'll get more on the return. And I just think it's about an attitude. When I get in situations where I got the craziest thing happen in my life, I adopt this mentality. I say, okay, back. Opportunity somewhere. Something about to blow. And every time I've done that, it's continued to help me going forward. So I do not want you guys to look at just getting by. What good are we gonna be? We got the brightest minds for the future in this room right now. And I mean that, I'm not being patronized. Hell, you guys are Western Michigan Broncos. So what good are you guys gonna do to survive? What does survival look like? Hell, you surviving now. You gonna be like this 20 years from now? No, thank you. So keep that in mind. When there's a pressure situation, like my purpose is on the other side of this. And it doesn't mean you don't prepare. Doesn't mean you just run out there. You work on your craft, you're serious about your craft, and you will get the opportunity. When that opportunity presents itself, you step up. So with that, I think that's probably the last slide. Got my contact information on there. Uh, there's another email I'm using at the time. Uh, and I missed the big question mark was supposed to go. I like to have my numbers even. I think it's at 29, so I'd like to have 30, but I blame it on Nick and Max. We were talking. I didn't get to add that one. So with that, you guys have been an excellent audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being attentive. I know it was a long little piece, but uh, at this time, what we have, I love to answer some questions that you guys may have. Yes, sir. What is the biggest risk you've ever taken? I left corporate America. Making hundred thousand dollars, not hundred thirty thousand dollars with my bonus. That's how I learned about taxes. Remember, this <laughs> calling my manager. I got my bonus check. It was supposed to be thirty grand, but luxury tax. I got like like forty percent. I remember I was driving back from Indianapolis, and I pulled over, man, and, and like and called him. I said, "Hey, man, what's up? With, what's up with this?" He's like, "Taxes, dude." He's like, make sure you want to be a Republican. Duh. I said, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> That's another conversation. So my point being, though, I had a company car, had a brand new Ford Explorer. My <clears> wife <throat> would get mad at me because I didn't know how much gas was. I had a gas. I'm like, how much is gas? I don't want to hear that. Gas is such and such. So I had all this going on. And I quit, man. I quit. I said, you know what? 
I'll never forget a young friend of mine. He's uh, he's running to be a judge in Ohio now. I never forget. He came from my office. Said, "Man, why would you leave a hundred thousand dollar job?" I said, "If they could pay me a hundred, I can make a million on my own." That's what I truly believe, and that's how you got to think. So that was the biggest risk because I took that risk when my daughter was born. My daughter had just been born, and I was like, either. I wear what you call these golden handcuffs. We talk about that in corporate America. Your golden handcuffs, you got all these, you know, accoutrements, all these nice little things, all this information, all this money, all this, but you're locked in. I, it wasn't my agenda. I wasn't promoting my own agenda. I was spending someone else's money to do that. But I said, man, my daughter is just being born. By the time she's of college age, I want to be able to do whatever. She may want to go to Stanford. I may want to. Move to California with it. So that was the biggest risk I took. And I'm so thankful for it. I'm so thankful for it because when other things happened in my life, because of what I went through then, I was prepared for it. So I would say walking away, but I didn't walk away. I walked into something else. That allows me to stand in front of you guys right now. Uh, feel very confident about what I'm sharing. I know that I'm living a purpose. That's an excellent question, but I would say that's the biggest risk. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'm coming right back through. Got to get you. You got the computer, man. <laughs> so, um, so when you're in college and you're thinking like to later in your career, you ever had like moments when you felt like you had nothing figured out? You didn't know like what was the road forward. Like, what did you do to like get yourself back on track? To, you know, Absolutely, man. I, I, did I have anything for you on campus? Hell no. I'm just trying to party. I'm trying to hang out. I mean, I'm being honest. I'm being trans. I went to school here. I mean, no, I don't have anything figured out. But what I did was every opportunity I got, I maximized it. So, for example, quick story about how I met the president of the university. Well, when I transferred, you know, uh, earlier, some told me they're like, man, you know, as a leader, I'm like, okay, well, who's the leader of the school? And I didn't have Google. I don't know how I found out who it was, but somehow I pulled up the picture of Dr. Henneke, older white gentleman. You know, whatever. I saw this picture. Okay, that's the present. It was just in the back of my mind. So one day we're all hanging out in the student union, hanging out middle of the day. I think I had a bowling class down, so we just hanging out. And I see him walk through with a hat on, really looking real low. Okay, I'm like, oh, that's the present. And none of these, I shouldn't say idiots, none of my friends knew who it was. I think I'm like, man, that's the present. They were like, so? I was like, dude, that's the president of the university. I was like, I got to do something. Like, I got action. I got to do something. So I went over to him. And I remember just standing in front of him, and, you know, he's, he's, he's going to be politically correct because I'm a student on campus. I remember just going, looking around, and there was a showcase. And the showcase was an a, a African-American sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. And I was like, Dr. Henneke, how you doing? And I was like, uh, this is Delta Sigma Theta, a sorority on campus. Just random, right? Random. But he peeped. He was like, oh, okay. All right, nice to meet you. What's your name? Like, Lindsey Huddleston. Fast forward. Saturday morning, I'll never forget. I hung out Friday night, right? You know, that little Saturday morning haze going on. <laughs> that little headache was in my head hurt. Phone rings. I'm like, who is calling? Like, Maybe it's my mom. She wouldn't even call me now. Pick up the phone. Can I speak to Lindsay Huddleston? My mind, Dr. Hedeke was German. I'm like, who is this? This is Dr. Hedeke. I said, who? Dr. Hedeke. I said, Dr. Hedeke, how you doing? I'm like, whoa. I'm like, hey. He goes, uh, would you be interested in an internship in Washington, D.C.? I was like, yes, basically, like, hell yeah. Now, here's the thing. The only thing that resonated with D.C. was this, the Washington Bullets. That's the only, when this heard D.C., I was like, oh, the Bullets play in D.C., that'd be great. I will say, you say, okay, we'll come on Monday, we'll meet. So fast forward. Monday we go, I go meet them. I don't know if they have this say in the Gilmore house. It's like right next to the administration building, whatever. I go over there and go in there to meet with them. We're at this table from here to the back of the room, or maybe half that. And it's him here. And it's the treasurer of the university. We go in, and I knew enough to get dressed, put on something. And in college, you don't have tuxedos, but I put on, I think I had a suit, but I, I, I put the effort in, right? Hey, this is Lindsay. He's going to have an internship in D.C. We already paid for it, but give him, what did he give me? Like, give him $3,000 out of my personal account. I'm like, what? You know? So he shot me some money. Uh, I go down to D.C., had this great internship, which was awesome. Then when I came back, he was like, all right, I want you to work in my office. All my buddies were, like, working in the calf, doing all kind of crazy stuff. So I got to keep going. So I ended up working in the president's office. And I remember one quick story. His wife, Carol, she's a lovely person. One day they were like, uh, Lindsay, why don't you um, 
Carol needs a ride to the hairdresser. You want to take her? I was like, yeah, sure. So I go get her. And this is back then, the big car phones. I'm like dating myself, right? About big as this computer that sat. Like, you guys wouldn't even know what these were if you saw them, right? They, like, sat on the sides. I remember dropping her off, and I was still on the clock. I worked from, like, 12 to 5. And she goes, uh, just just go. Go to the mall or something. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I drive off. I'm looking at that phone like, man, whose number do I know? And I end up calling some of my buddies. Hey, man, I'm in the president's car and blah, blah, blah. And they took a great liking to me. They would call me on the weekends. I think Carol had broke her foot. So they would call me, hey, Lindsay, you want to stop by? So I would stop by. I would go to dinner with them. He took me to the liquor store. Went to the liquor store with the president. He was like, uh, um, what else do we need, Lindsay? I was like, oh, we need some Heinekens. We need <laughs> and he got Jägermeister. We had a great relationship. He flew me to, to New York. They would take the choir to New York every year to uh, Manhattan for these Broadway shows. So I was part of the entourage. And then he hooked me up with Mayor Archer in Detroit. So all that goes back to you guys got to make a move. Let me tell you this. Right now, it's cool. You guys got to be hustlers out here. You got to step into people. You got to make people know you. Max, excellent job. Max hit me up on LinkedIn. Hey, yada, yada. I'm like, okay. That's what you got to do. You got to reach out. You got to be pleasantly persistent. Okay. Hey, just reach out again, Nick. Just want to let you know. You know, that's how to be with Chelsea. She wouldn't return any of my emails or anything, but she finally, I'm joking. She did. She was very helpful. But, but that's how you build these relationships. So I don't want you guys to get caught up in this paralysis of thinking things. Dude, make a move. Call somebody. Send them a note. Say, hey, we met before. Keep introducing yourself because that's how you go. And they'll finally go, oh. And if you're really passionate about it, you're not making a fool of yourself. You know when you make a fool of yourself? You don't do it. John Combs, Puff Daddy, said uh, Heavy D was his connect into the music industry. And he said it got to the point where he would walk to where Heavy's house was. There was a fork in the road. It went one way or the other. And he would stand at that fork because he knew he was going to pass by. And he just wanted him to see him. Y'all talk about y'all want to do this sports thing. You want to be GMs. You want to do all that. But if you're not ready to sacrifice and put yourself out there, you're just talking. I'm not doing you no good driving in from Lansing to have this conversation and not talk to you like this. You're going to have to separate yourself. Coach Harbaugh talks about how do you make separation? How do you separate yourself from everybody else? Everybody's going to come with a nice resume and all this, but can you say, wait, well, all last summer, um, I was a ball boy, and I, you know, I, I did this one. This is a little project I've been working on. You got to come with something already. Nick and I were talking, excellent, what he's working on. He got something tangible that's going to make him stand out. Me, he's talking about sports psychology. Nobody else is talking about that. And I know my crap. And I know it well. And that's how you want to situate yourself. So I know your question didn't mean to take it there, but it's a great question to set us up. I'd love to get some more in before we wrap up. Yes, sir. Travis, thanks again for the computer, man. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> So the big thing with this generation is you said like mental toughness, and that's kind of what you focus on. And with social media, people are always like bringing other people down and like comparing um, themselves to each other. So what I want to go into is probably going to deal with a lot of social media. Is there any advice that you have or that your company uses to kind of like stay above that mentality because you still have to use social media all the time? Yeah, you do. It's very good. Well, that goes back to my 10-minute miracle. You got to purge beforehand. Social media can get real nasty and toxic. And if you go into it already clouded, or you know, if you were, if you had a you know if you were up all night and you try to go do something else, it's not, that's like being up all night and going to your job wearing the same clothes, not showering, not shaving, whatever. If you follow my analogy, so if you can be at a point that you can purge yourself with social media, you can cleanse yourself and your thoughts. Maybe even take a break. Take a break for a while. Now listen. If you can't, you're not going to get a job calling you on social media for the most part. So you can put that down for a while. If you can't put your phone away half a day or a day, I mean, he just said to Don, I don't think you're really equipped to be taking on leadership roles. You've got to be able to put it down sometimes. So to that point, it's really about how you feel personally. So that toxicity you see doesn't affect you personally, but you can recognize it as being toxic. Kind of what I talked about, letting those negative thoughts pass through. So you want to be at a point you say, oh, that's jacked up, right? But it doesn't impact you. It doesn't trigger you. But that goes back to what are you getting up with in the morning? Are you getting up doing some meditation? Are you getting up? Are you exercising? Are you presenting yourself to be ready for this onslaught of this nastiness that comes? And sometimes the positive things can wear you out too, get you too hyped. 
Everything looks too perfect. You know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I really think, Travis, it comes down to where you are personally and you can decipher the difference and call it for what it is. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I know networking is like very important. I know you touched on it, like being a gym rat and LinkedIn and stuff. Do you have any other networking strategies? Well, well I look at networking like <laughs> this. It's, um, thank you. I look at networking as, I don't call it networking if you're doing what you like to do. The hard part about networking is being somewhere you want to be there. You know, I don't mind wearing ties. I used to wear ties all the time. I had a tie when I came down and I changed clothes. And I said, I'm not wearing this tie. Because my whole point was, I've worked to get to this point where I can be comfortable presenting myself as who I am. And I'm not uncomfortable about being here, being with you guys. I'm not out of my element. So I think the key for you, tell me your name again. Sam. Sam, that's right. The key, Sam, is just be where you want to be, be in your element. Then it's not networking. It's just hanging out. That's different when you're sitting somewhere, like I'm at a state practice, and the NBA scout sits next to me, and he tells me something like, look, man, just to let you know, if you get on the draft board, you got to go. That's just a little advice that scout gave me. He said, because if you, if they talk about you, as far as being a first-round draft pick, go. Go right then. Because you know why? He said, if you stay, we get more time than they pick you. And there's no benefit. But that, again, was me being where I just wanted to be. There was no challenge me being there. It's just hanging out. So the key, Sam, is the hell with all the other stuff. Go where you want to be. If it's just hanging out. If it's baseball, you just go hang around, and you go tell the coach, hey, man, can I just come out and help? I love, say, I love this sport. I love being around here, man. For me, the gym, man, I love that wax smell. I don't know if something about it takes me back when you go that. No, it's that oil. You know when they used to clean the gym floor, and they sprinkled it like the, the resin down and so you go into a gym and you smell like it might be toxic <laughs> but you're like oh but that's where I want to be and there's no other place I want to be and as long as I know my family is set and they're good I'm where I want to be so Sam I encourage you go places you want to be and it's not networking it's just Sam being on the scene hey man I'm just hanging out and it's good because if you go somewhere and you're like uncomfortable that's going to come off like you don't even want to be here you know does that help <laughs> yeah I hope it does I just want to emphasize that real quick um I'm not qualified to speak about that as, as much as Lindsay is, but I've talked to some of you guys individually this semester so far, and uh, you know I've, I've talked about kind of making um, networking a priority and like professional development and all that. Um, like Lindsay is saying right now, uh, do not approach it like you're trying to get some certain value out of this person. Just make a connection with people. You know, strive to make a, make a connection. Just don't don't uh, don't think it's a bigger moment than it is. I guess is what I'm. But I would say um, just try to connect with people and, and don't look at it from such a professional perspective or whatever. Just just try to make genuine connections and like get to know people, I guess, is what I would, I would say. I'm kind of trying to cut the word networking out of our club. Um, so you That's a great point. I want to follow up on that. Excellent point, Max. It's been said the easiest thing. No, don't leave. Don't go. We see you. Thanks a lot. You were really locked in, too. Take care, buddy. Um, the best thing you could do, Sam, to Max's point, is ask people to tell them about themselves. That's the one subject they're expert on, and just people like to talk about themselves. So tell me what got you into this. So, so really, so uh, when did you make a decision to change? And you're going to get people, like, kind of going through a cathartic process. And you know what they're going to say? I like you, Sam, because they don't look at it as if you were working it. But what they really did is that they just got to feel good about themselves, and you were one of the triggers. So if you get somewhere and say, hey, I'm just trying to learn more about this field. So, so what made you get into it? How would you stay into all this time? And the questions will start coming up naturally when you realize, well, I'm probing this person. And, man, you're going to be their best buddy. It happens all the time. To be honest, if they want to know about you, they'll ask. But they probably really don't know about you. They probably made the job, well, this is a young college kid. What can they tell me? I mean, unless you went to their alma mater or something. But when you get it back on them, and that's a networking tool for all you guys. They may not even really be enjoying talking to you, but they're enjoying that they're talking about themselves. And that they, they're going back to their mental recesses, too. So definitely, when it gets tight, get them to talk about themselves. And you'll get something. They probably won't even remember you, but they'll say, take my car, call me. Or then when you see them again, hey, we were talking about, oh, yeah, this is, this is Sam. Works all the time. A couple of drinks don't hurt either. But anyway, works all the time. Uh, what's up? What? One book that, that helped me with my career change was The Mindful Athlete by George Mumford. George Mumford is considered like Mr. Sports Psychology because he went to college with uh, 
Julius Irvin and Dr. J, they were roommates at Mass University of Massachusetts. They played, you know, whatnot. But, of course, Dr. J went on to become Dr. J. He ended up having some personal issues in his life and got into uh, mindfulness. And it was funny because the reason – and this is the cool thing. He didn't say, I want to be Michael Jordan's, you know, consultant. He was working in the prisons. He was helping prisoners deal with mindfulness and things. So what happened was, um, I think, Phil Jackson's wife somehow went there or heard about him and made the plug. So you see, when you're in your space, when you're only your space, when you're in your groove, Travis, about what you want, people go find you, man. There's no other way. That's the best way you can make noise for yourself. When you're handling it, this is like when you sent that note out or whoever sent that out, Lindsay Hill said, Wes, man, my phone was blowing up. People were like, man, I see you on your grind. Are you killing it? That, that made people step back and be like, man, but that's only because I've been in the same space. That Matt was able to look, see a Western alum, follow me for a little while. Like, okay, this got to be a good speaker. But that translated to the rest of the world. Like, man, he's killing. So my point being is I dare you to do what you want to do. I dare you. I dare you to become the expert in your field on that and just keep going and keep digging down. See, what happens is we try to spread it across. You really got to go down. See, this is trying to be safe, but I told you that word is not really a real word. Safety is like a vapor. They say love is too. That's another conversation, right? I'm sorry. Sorry, God. Sorry. Right? Don't spread across. Drill down. You drill down, man, that's a solid foundation, and they got to call you, and they got to pay you. When you drill down, they have to call you. That's like when your plumbing goes in the middle of the night, you don't argue with the guy who's coming to fix your plumbing. Or when your heat goes off in the middle of winter, you don't argue with them about rates. you got to call them, and you got to pay them. So what I would suggest is I dare you to find topics that you're very interested in and drill down on, despite what everyone's saying. Because the other part is, Things trend. I'm going to wrap up some more. Things trend. The movie Sleepless in Seattle, right? Never seen it. Seen parts of it, right? It's supposed to be some great hit. But the storyline was, I think I hit on Chelsea's movie, right? The storyline was this lady had a boutique bookstore, right? All right? And they were going up against the big box bookstore, right? And that was a big thing. This big box bookstore was coming in. It was going to take over these small little boutique bookstores. Hell, the big box bookstores not even around anymore. Things trend. They ebb and flow. So don't try to ride a trend. Don't just say, oh, this is hot right now. Because when it fizzles and fades, where are you going to be? But if you find something like, man, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this. And if it comes down to it, you'll be the only person on the planet that knows this particular thing about this particular subject. You stand on it. You own it, and you have a great life. So I challenge you with that. Don't get caught up in just going along and get along. Find out what your passion, and your passion may change. But at least for that time, you have that, and you will find those skill sets built on top. Me being a governor's advanced person and have to show up at an event, meet somebody, talk to them for a second. The governor comes in, brief her real quick, and then go to the next event. How do you think that helps when I got Coach Izzo in front of me and I got to get his attention and talk to him about something? or have some questions for some players or, you know, a, a top draft pick. And it's crazy. These kids are younger than me, but the status that they get, they kind of – or I have to walk across the gym at a pro-am to go get Miles Bridges while he's signing artists. And Miles needs to do his interview with me. All right, hold I'm coming. And walk him over there. Or Gabe Brown is out there going for 59 points. He twists his ankle. The whole gym goes <gasps> – and I have to be the one to go on the court and hold the game up, direct people to get him out of here. Not because that's my job, because nobody else is going to do it. So the whole point is own what you want to do and be about that. It will serve you right going forward. I promise. I promise. Any more questions before we wrap up? Yes, sir. I know your job involves a lot of traveling. How do you balance your traveling life? That's very good. The reality is that, um, fortunately, uh, my wife has been very understanding. She just knows this is who I am. Unfortunately for my daughter, I think more so for me, my daughter's like, whatever. Like, I told her, I said, baby, daddy's going to be gone all week. I dropped her off at school this morning, and when I get home tonight, she'll be fast asleep. I'll go give her a kiss, and I'll wake her up in the morning, and I'll probably stop by and see her at lunch. So I live my life in segments with her, and almost in minutes, unfortunately, during this time right now. But I'm okay with that, because when I'm there with her, I'm there with her. 
I think sometimes we get caught up and say, oh, I got to do all this. But when we hang, we hang. And in most take kind of cases, she's off somewhere with my wife or doing whatever, so I'm okay with it. It's an excellent question. But it also goes back to the mate you choose or the one you're with to kind of be understanding of it. Because I tell you what, if you get with somebody and they be like, oh, you got another sporting event, I just hate to tell you, it's not a good look. Because if you're saying right now you're committed to sports and they don't have enough going on on their own, whether it's being about sports or have enough going on as an individual that they can be like, okay, I get it. It's going to be a hard way to go. And I wasn't here to give relationship advice or anything like that. However, the question, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And at the end of the day, everyone's not going to see your vision. I hate to be like that. You might be like, well, baby, I got to do what I got to do right now. You know, and I talked to, talked to you earlier about being able to meet at the top. And if it's meant to be, it'll happen. But fortunately for me, I'm at a point where I'm good with it because I know what I'm doing is uh, beneficial uh, for my daughter. Uh, we, we cool. We roll. She's my roll dog. Like, she's seven. And um, she likes to call me Day-Day. She saw the movie Friday one day. And Day-Day, the character, you know, she, call, she figured that's calling me daddy. Day-Day, get over here. But anyway, that's an excellent question. But, you know, um, that's not for me to answer. That's for your significant other to answer. You know, hope that helps. Anybody else? You guys were wonderful. I really appreciate coming out. Um, thank you for taking the time. Um, look forward to being a resource to you guys whenever. Uh, you can get my contact from Max. Uh, feel free to reach out. You can't contact me too much. I'm a fellow alum. I'm your inaugural speaker, so I consider myself part of you guys' family. Anything I can do to help you guys, let me know. So thank you for your time.